All right. Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 113, That's the Trick. Great trick-taking games. Live from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. New York, Toronto time at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right, tonight we've got a question about traditional trick-taking card games, playing card games. It's going to lead us into some modern trick-taking card game recommendations. We continue with modern card games based on classics with reviews of Ratuki from The Op, and a trick-taking game called Macaron, launching soon on Kickstarter from Sunrise Tornado Games. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interaction with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we received, comments on our content, and cool gaming stuff we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com, that's S-E-A-N. Or you can hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Up first, a comment on our Exit the Game Catacombs of Horror review from John James, who says, I played this one sitting. Worst decision. We completed it in four and a half hours, I think. It was rough. Yeah, I, I can see that. Uh, John, we, we, when we originally sat down to play that, when we were getting together over at Brenda's place to play it, we had expected to finish it in one setting, actually. We were hoping to. We were like, we got to get it done because we're going to review it on Wednesday. And I am so glad we broke it up. Like, I think our closer, t- our total time, was closer to almost six hours and i am so glad we didn't do that at once and as we noted in the review there were some frustrating moments there that were alleviated by taking a break when you looked back on it it wasn't quite as bad as it felt in the moment and i think that break helped us enjoy the game a little bit more thanks for the comment john well next a couple of comments on our awesome patreon patrons on our topic of the best horror board games Mm -hmm. first math guy dave says Thought of one more horror-ish game, the D&D board game Castle Ravenloft. It's one of those, uh, it's the better of those board games and pretty good horror theme with vampires and such. Next up, Joe Swick commented, I can't believe the betrayal at House on the Hill didn't make the list. A travesty. All right, thanks for the comments, both of you. And of course, bigger thanks for being supporters of the show. All right, up first, the D&D board games. I gotta admit, I did not think of that. And of all of them, the one I actually owned myself was the Ravenloft one, because I had heard it's the best of the bunch. And it was good. But I don't know. I just, I didn't, I don't think a D&D is horror themed. Like, it just doesn't give me feelings of horror, even though you're fighting bats and undead. Like, I guess it fits. Like, to be honest, it probably fits better than some of the games we did put on the list. So fair enough. Math Gay Dave, you win. That one belongs on there. We'll toss that in the show notes. All right. Next is Joe's comment about Betrayal. I get it. Everyone, well, not everyone, but lots of people seem to love this game. Betrayal House of the Hill is a classic. It's in three editions now. We probably should have put this one into our honorable mentions, actually, just because of the number of people who like it. Just personally, I just find the game too fragile. Like, first off, it needs the right group of people. And that group of people have to include people who pay attention to detail. I've had too many games of Betrayal where someone reads the haunt wrong and ruins the game for everyone because they didn't understand something properly. And then there's the fact that some haunts are just can be broken. Like I remember one where someone where we had to kill this monster that got stuck in a chute in the basement and there was no way to get to them and we just had to end the game. I just can't recommend a game that might be good some of the time but could be terrible due to it just not working every time. So that's why Betrayal, you're never going to find that on any of my lists. I apologize for the fans out there. I'm glad you enjoy it. I'm glad you found something to love. You obviously have a group that's willing to put up with its idiosyncrasies and pay attention to detail. All right, well, finally, a great comment we got on the Tales from the Loop Starter Box RPG review segment of our live show from a couple of weeks back. Stacey Hampton wrote, Great review, guys. You hit all the important points necessary in making a decision whether or not to buy this. 
This RPG caught my eye through a series of events that started with the upcoming release of the board game. Intrigued, I discovered the artist and the artist books, the TV mm. series, and then the RPG. For someone like me who enjoys the art and the gameplay, I am now introduced to the world of RPG and considering tipping, for, tipping my toe in for the first time. I think this would be a good intro for me. Thanks so much. Well, thanks so much for the comment, Stacey. This one made me really happy when it showed up in my YouTube notifications. I shared this one right away with Deanna and Sean. I'm like, oh, check out this awesome one. These are the kind of comments we love to see, and it makes what we do worth it, right? Like, I'm like, oh, my God, like, the whole, you actually nailed it. We got all the important points, and we made someone decide to get into RPGs. So we are introducing someone to a whole new aspect of the hobby, and that feels fantastic. That is that is mainly our goal here, is to, again, make your game nights better, right? To introduce people to new games, to give people new things to play and new things to enjoy i love it well that's it for this week's comments thanks to everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content well now that uh things are wrapping up in the big world of politics slowly but surely time to relax with some games a few quick announcements before we continue uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox once a week. I send out a newsletter that recaps everything we released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, or anything else we create. You can sign up by going to tabletopbellhop.com and subscribing right there in the sidebar, or go over to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right, the only th other thing I've got this week is a reminder that our Animal Empire giveaway is still going strong over on the blog. This contest has two more weeks to go, ending the 18th of November. Now, to enter, all you got to do is head over to tabletopbellhop.com and check out the pinned post. Good luck. We love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. If you are here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and content that otherwise only our patrons get. All right, so I feedback in the chat room. As soon as we started talking about D&D &D and horror games, we got some feedback right away. Uh, so Jeff is the same, thinking the same way I am. He's like, I don't know about D&D &D board games for Halloween. Maybe a D&D &D adventure with a Halloween theme, but meh. I will point out the board game in question here is based on the Ravenloft world, which is the horror setting for D&D. &D. Though I just never found Ravenloft all that horrible because it's D&D. &D. Like, you're, you're going to kill the things you're not running away from the things you're finding maybe finding out their weaknesses like sure you're fighting vampires and werewolves and and, uh, and mummies or whatever but it's they're still like they could be goblins orcs and demons as far as most D is concerned i know i never personally was able to really instill that horror into ravenloft except for the fact that you couldn't get home like there was that aspect of it, of the getting stuck in the mist. That was about the only thing horrible that ever thing happened. And once the players eventually gave up on ever getting home, it just, the horror element was kind of gone. Yeah. And I, to be fair, I mean, we would never really ran it um, as uh, any sort of uh, horror event. I mean, when, anytime it was mm. D&D, &D, it was d and &D. I mean, it's, it's a fantasy, right. a fantasy RPG. If we wanted horror, we went over and played chill. Um, yeah. So there was no real sort of drive to work the horror into it, to make it a horror game. Right. No, I agree. And like I said, I owned Ravenloft. I read it. I, I don't know. It didn't really have a bunch of tips and tricks to make things. Like there were no real suggestions on how to make them more horrible. Um, uh, Evil John saying Strahd can be horror for sure. Strahd is, is the adventure set in Ravenloft for the, the fifth edition. I have the original AD&D adventure and a second, and I actually ran it in fourth edition because there was a an update on the dungeon online, the magazine. And I got to admit, it was one of the worst adventures I ever ran. The The main fight with Strahd, which should have been dramatic, was not. And I, I'm not going to get into why, but it just wasn't good. It, it was not fun. Uh, the other thing we're talking about a lot in the lobby is sports and sports games. So I think we're going to put a pin in that one. I don't know who will credit. Maybe Evil John is the one that mainly suggested it'd be a good topic. I think we're going to put a pin in that one to come back to at some point. Because in the two years we've been doing this, that's something we've never covered. And while I may not be an expert on, well, definitely not an expert on sports, but not even an expert on sports games, I do have some personal favorites. Plus, as usual, we can do some research. And I think that, that'll be a useful one to put out there. Absolutely. There's a lot of uh, sports games out there. And as we move into the colder months in the Northern Hemisphere, 
you know, there's some, uh, and, and having missed a lot of the sports that uh, mm-hmm. we normally would have gotten this year, thanks to the pandemic and with shortened seasons and so forth, uh, a little bit of sports fun might just be what the doctor ordered. There you go. Just jumping back again to Ravenloft, I guess I ran Ravenloft more horrible than I thought since Angie Games played in that game and she says I felt Ravenloft you were doomed you were stuck and you weren't actually going to take out Strahd so I guess I did a better job of it than I thought I guess as a DM it just felt like just another D&D setting to me but again for board like compared to other stuff on our list where like you're fighting the universal monsters how is that any different than fighting mummies or whatever although they're based on horror movies instead of D&D I don't know we'll throw it in the show notes we'll keep it in there um, and of course, I, I'm amused that Tech had to point out, no, I apologize, we still do not have Canadian merchandise. Um, like I said, uh, Canada is not doing so great with the COVID compared to they were in the past. Parts of the country are not doing well, and our potential source happens to be in one of the hot spots. So I think it's going to be some time. I'm sorry, we're working on it. But for those of you in the States, you can go to merch.streamlabs.com slash tabletop bellhop to find tabletop bellhop merchandise. If you do, I would love it if you tag me online with a picture. I would love to see what some of this stuff looks like. Absolutely. And uh, who knows? We had one patron for uh, featured on the show in their merch. You could be too. Yep. There you go. Yeah, we'll share the picture. Or if you don't want to share a picture, we could do that too. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so tonight we're talking trick-taking games. We're not talking sports. We're not talking horror. So before we get into game recommendations, we are going to be looking to the chat room for feedback on their personal experience with trick-taking games. This is more like when you were growing up, did you play, did you not, did you see it, was it around? That's going to tie into the question once we get to it. Now, once we do get to game recommendations, we would also, of course, love to hear about the games we missed. As usual, we're going to do a list of 10 games tonight, and there is no way that is close to covering all the trick-taking games out there. There are a lot of them. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through our website or joining us live on Twitch where you can just send your questions directly. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight's topic comes from patron of the show and local Windsor game designer, Roger Malash, who writes, Hey Mo, I'm still enjoying and learning a lot from your podcasts. I recently came up with a dice game called Euchre Dice. I pretty much learned to count playing games like Euchre and Crazy Eights, so I thought Euchre Dice would be a game that everyone could enjoy. (laughs) I started to playtest the game, and I couldn't find any players who were familiar with Euchre, and a very few who were familiar with trick-taking games in general. Growing up, I remember seeing at least one, if not a few, Euchre games going on in high school and college Mm -hmm. cafeterias at any given time, as well as parties at work, family get-togethers. I was surprised to see how few hobby gamers had played games like these. There seems to be some sort of cultural divide between today's hobby gamer and traditional games like Euchre. Is this just a local phenomena, or is this there some type of cultural divide that needs to be bridged? Well, thanks for the very detailed question, Roger. Um, So what I thought we'd do with Roger's question here is we're going to start off with an open discussion between Sean and I, as well as the chat, on the popular traditional card games right now in 2020. Um, A lot of that I'm hoping we can get some feedback from the chat room, since Sean and I are pretty much the same age and would have had similar experiences, especially going to schools in Windsor, right? We're both from Windsor. So hoping to get a little bit more feedback on that. From there, though, what I want to do is I want to move on to some game recommendations where we'll suggest some modern trick-taking games, hobby board games that we think are great and worth checking out. Yep. Now, to start off, how about we talk about our personal history? So your history, my history with trick-taking games. Now, like, was you went to a different high school than I did. We went, you went to a totally different university out of town. So was Euchre a thing like at the, in the assumption lunchroom? Did you play cards with your parents growing up? What's your so, background with it? So Euchre in high school, Euchre was definitely a thing yeah. in the cafeteria. Uh, and there was actually, I believe even a Euchre club in the school mm-hmm. um, that did uh, their own sort of more competitive thing aside right. from, you know, kids just throwing down de- a deck of cards. Um while cribbage and other ca- classic card games, I did learn at home. Euchre, we, we were never a Euchre family at home. Uh, it was definitely a school thing. Um, then there was uh, a few other tr- games. Uh, I don't even know the polite name for the one game that uh, President. 
Is that what it is? Um, yeah, that's one of the polite names. Okay, I, I only ever knew it as the the name I can't say on our podcast. Yes. Um, <laughs> that we were played that for a, a lot until it was banned and everyone went back to euchre. Um, but uh, one thing I've noticed uh, growing up, uh, both in your family, uh, my grandparents, and then again with Sherry's family in Welland, there seems to be a strong French Canadian mm-hmm. root to a lot of these card games. And I don't know if that's just my personal uh, observational bias or if it's a real thing that there there is just this uh, history of traditional card games in the French community. I, well, I've definitely seen that side of it myself with my parents coming from the French community, Canadian community, but also um, the biggest place is my parents used to be members of various uh, social clubs um, from church groups to Knights of Columbus to the Moose Lodge, to the Legion, things like that. Um, yes, my dad did serve at one time. So, and those, at least in Windsor, were primarily French Canadian members, especially the Knights of Columbus was a very strong French Canadian uh, club, at least locally. I, I actually don't know if worldwide the Knights of Columbus are have a French Canadian t- tend to them or not. But well, I think a lot gaming. of it is. I think a lot of it is is um, the, both the region, uh, but also yeah. um, it's uh, nice. Columbus is is a very Catholic uh, yes, group, which and is also that does very tend French to lean Canadian. towards the, the French Canadian side yes. of things. Fair enough, but like that was it was huge. Like like to be honest, there was always a deck of cards readily available at my house. Like my my mom and dad used to leave a deck out on their dining room table. Almost every place we went for dinner or to hang out was a place where there would be cards available. Uh, again, the Knights of Columbus, the Legion, stuff like that. My my dad uh, also played a lot of um, local sports, and we go back to whatever sports bar, whatever the the you'd support the venue, right? Like uh, the sponsor, you'd support the sponsor. You go play baseball. You go back if you struck out, you buy a pitcher of beer, and everyone sat around playing. It's like it just ubiquitous. Like there was, I, I grew up surrounded by people playing traditional card games. Now, my parents did play Euchre, but mostly only, for, like, my dad refused to play Euchre for fun. He only played for money. So they would join leagues. They would join Euchre leagues and enter Euchre tournaments. For them, though, the big game was Crib, and that still is. For both my parents, were, were, were was Cribbage. That was the game they liked the most. Now, high school, Euchre was huge. Just like Sean said, everyone was playing it. I'll admit I wasn't. By then, I had discovered role-playing games and other hobby board games, and I was more interested in sitting in a corner reading my Roma Chaos books during my lunch break. But it, it did seem like everyone else was playing it. University, you saw it, but the big thing that happened when we were in university, at least in Windsor, was the collectible card games hit. And those spread beyond just the gaming community. Like, like that got a lot of new people. And I saw more people playing Magic the Gathering than I saw playing Euchre or Poker or anything like that. Now, people did play traditional card games, but more often I saw people playing Magic or some variant of a Jihad or whatever, Miskatonic or any of the other CCGs out at that time. But even then, people were starting to get distracted technology. Because the other big thing that happened was people moved from Magic onto Moos and Muds. And even Sean was part of that, too. And that was a big shift. Like, all of a sudden, all the people were sitting around playing Magic were now sitting in the computer science lab in this virtual world doing that instead. Which I think goes to what we're going to get some comments later from our uh, our Discord channel. And I think that kind of ties in a bit. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I I didn't, I, in the high school, I definitely didn't see the the shift while I was there to that digital uh, format, it was still very much uh, card based in some form or other. Um, right. And of course we weren't, you know, we didn't have cell phones. <laughs> my, I didn't well, get yeah, my first no. cell phone until I was uh, almost graduating university. But um, it's, uh, it's interesting. I think uh, there's definitely some of the, the Yu-Gi-Oh and the Pokemon that sort of took over. Uh, but right. then those got banned as well. Um, like I know, again, this is a, a different in, in the grade school, going down to the grade school, but with my kids, uh, they were interested in br- doing the card thing and bringing the Pokemon, mm-hmm. but then those were banned for various reasons because there were bad actors, you know, scamming kids for valuable cards that the kids just thought were cool. Mm-hmm. And those were all banned and nothing ever really seemed to replace it. Like there was no, no one ever wanted to play even, even something like Uno or something like that with right. the other kids from school. Um, those kids, games still get played at home uh we'll still play uh, play uno and a few other card games with the kids but there's never really been any interest that i've seen from the kids at school to continue that sort of uh trend 
Now, when they banned card games, did they ban all card games? Like, could you bring a deck of traditional playing cards? Or I, it was, I was all, it was only ever just uh, like like specific, specific games. games. You know, they banned Pokemon, and I believe they banned Yu Gi Oh. Um, yeah. And it was See, all because never, of that trading. We played a couple times here, and my kids never got into it. I don't know why. I mean, it was probably banned at their school before they <laughs> before they could really Quite do possibly. it. So, jumping to modern times. I got to admit, I don't see it much now with gamers. Like, I don't think I've ever seen anyone break out a deck of cards at a WGR event. And I've been running WGR events since 2002. So in the last 18 years at public play gaming events, I don't see traditional card games, right? Like, like oh, I'll admit, I've seen decks of cards. But like, we use them to draw prizes and use a deck of cards to do initiative in Savage Worlds. And there's RPGs that use deck of cards. But like, I haven't seen a group sit down and play euchre or hearts or spades or any of those ever like at, at the cg realm at ian's hugan immune in years ago like it just never happened now for the next the previous generation my mom still plays cards like if it wasn't covid right now my mom would be at the moose lodge in the west windsor playing at her euchre club that she went to every wednesday before we locked down and i know where my dad lives um in long-term care they have regular card game nights though sadly my dad's not able to take part but they, they constantly like there is definitely a generational my parents played it more than we did i play it less than they do and my kids we had to teach when how to do a trick-taking game the other day right yeah it's interesting i mean because you've got uh even classic kids games like uh old maid and things you know mm -hmm. there are there are trick trick-taking games out there for the kids but even those I don't think are getting the same level of attention that they once did. Uh, interestingly, I just actually caught an article on line from Detroit in 2019 talking about how Euchre has dimmed, but is still being played in Ontario, the Midwest, and then Australia and New Zealand. Okay. Um, so I think sure. uh, a large amount of America may have never really done the Euchre thing. So maybe it is local. It, it does seem to be more of a Midwest, Ontario, sort of that, that, that central area uh sort of thing and again i i do think there are some family um aspects to it so then like i would think i never taught our kids how to play crazy eights i think someone at one point taught them to play war but it wasn't me <laughs> i wouldn't have taught them to play war um like also like this is we were talking trick taking but like i used to play solitaire a lot mm -hmm. and that's one i definitely think has been replaced by a phone well, Solitaire, I mean, Windows, like, Windows killed Solitaire. Right, Windows, yeah, Windows exactly. 95, from Windows 95 on, why would anyone yeah. play, lay out a deck of cards when you can play Solitaire? Especially the Solitaire they've got now in, in the Windows yeah. 10 version. It's an obnoxious See, thing I to throw ads it. at you. But uh, oh. once, once you get away from the ads, it's actually got, you know, four or five different uh, variants. And it's it's a really fun way to play Solitaire. All right, so you're talking about localization. I know we have someone from the desert down a little more south than the rest of us and in the chat room. Now, I haven't been watching the chat as quick. But Any they, experience with Euchre in that back then? Never heard of it is the is what Pennywise is saying. Never heard of Euchre. What? <laughs> Euchre? Wow. Yeah. So there you go. Never heard of Euchre. Wow. So, yeah, I guess it. there you go, Roger. Here's here's one of your answers. It is localized. Um, I will admit, I, we didn't do any research before this. So you're getting a very biased, uh, narrow view here, though at least Sean went a little further up north. Um, we do have a lot of other people in the chat room. What do we got from the chat? I saw Cribbage is popular and so on. We got, thank you. I got to say, first off, thanks for the awesome amount of interaction. Like, that is the, the most number of stuff I've had to scroll back to in a long time <laughs> on our chat room. Yeah, apparently uh, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania are part of the Euchre Belt in the States. Okay. Uh, and Michigan is the buckle of the Euchre Belt. The Euchre Belt. <laughs> okay, what about like other like uh, hearts or spades or like other trick-taking games? Yeah, I don't know. I, I suspect or it's poker. probably... Like, like well, poker's poker, pretty... Po yeah, poker's a, a very big... U ubiquitous, right? Like yeah. poker is a trick-taking game. It's more of a gambling game, but it is definitely a trick-taking game. I don't know. Um, so Jeff Seuss is no, it was only around when my parents, aunt and uncle played Euchre. Hmm. He personally avoided them until recently, which I think is awesome. I like, I love this one. I use decks of cards as a box of bookmarks. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I do remember a time, like when I was a kid, like we used to just play with cards, right? Like you heard houses, things before you learned how to play. But again, they were everywhere. Yeah. 
Now, Tech, again, I think is around our age group and from Windsor. So, yes, he played all the time in high school. Uh, Pennywise's parents played Hearts a lot. So, there you go. Okay. So, so, yeah. So, Hearts, it's not... Like, I prefer, personally, I'm, I'm not a big Euchre fan. I like Hearts and Spades. are my, my two favorite classic card games. I never got into Crib. I don't know. So, reasons Jeff didn't dig them is they him and his friends felt that the games needed a theme, even if it's a, a thin one. To enjoy a game, you wanted to have a theme to it. And I will admit, that is true. Like, card, most card games are, are pure abstracts. There is zero, zip, not a, no theme, which I think is one of the changes, actually, when we get into the modern trick-taking games, is they are all actually pretty heavily themed. Uh, Wizard being one that's not which again, we're kind of spoiling some of the stuff we're going to talk about later, but that's fine. Yeah. But like you look at games like, like the crew or whatever, like they're all theme, like, like you're using the mechanics to tell a story as opposed to spades, euchre, diamonds, clubs, um, and poker. Like what, what, to be honest, is there a story? I wonder if there is a story behind them. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, as far as I know, I mean, they're all basically gambling games uh, without, right. you know, without, ga- without uh, money involved in most uh, family cases anyway. Like there's um, obviously a royal tie-in because you've got the the queen, king, and jack, right? Like whereas you know chess is supposed to be a war, I kind of wonder what a card game is supposed to represent. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, Cribbage caught me to count to fifteen. Maybe that's my problem. <laughs> so Jeff noted that um, that that Yu-Gi-Oh was of course big. So I, I do think collectible cards did replace playing cards to at least some extent yeah at least locally um jeff did note that 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 game president he also knew people that played yeah no there's it's interesting like because the problem the one of the problems with cards is they go back to you know prehistory well forever i mean egyptians uh you know uh the time of the pyramids were playing with decks of cards uh and you know whether or not it was a king or a queen or a you know god or a pharaoh at the time uh, right. it's it's changed so i suspect that you know one to ten is the easy number and then you you go whatever your to, uh, to special 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 uh higher yeah. higher values are above that. I, I just it's like i know go is also supposed to represent the battle right and it's, right. it's surrounding your enemy and trying to control areas of the board just wondered uh roger's got an amusing one my mom can can't remember what she had for lunch because she kills still kick my butt in euchre um, I will say that, that that was one of the things with my dad's declining health that, man, he was able to play cards for quite some time and may still even be able to, honestly, if you gave him a deck of cards and you just started playing, he might be able to even pick it up. But it was actually um, his inability to play Magic the Gathering, which was my first indicator that something was wrong. That's actually what got me to have him go see a doctor is we were at a Knights of Columbus because that's what my dad and I did is we went to Knights of Columbus we drank cheap beer we played pool and we played games and I got I was we'd done it a bunch of times in a row I don't know if he was on vacation I was on shutdown whatever it was and I decided to grab I was cleaning up and I found a sealed deck of Mirage and a sealed deck of um, whatever the one after that the desert one Uh, no it was Ice Age and Mirage sorry those two sets And I'm like, oh my God, we have two sealed decks here. So I brought them thinking this will be hilarious. We'll each crack open a deck and just play magic. And he wasn't able to play. And I'm like, wow, okay, that's not right, dad. Like, and that's what finally got him to go get diagnosed. And we found out that he had early stage Alzheimer's at the time. Right. Uh, There was marbles. People noticed that. People played marbles and pogs. Pogs, that's the other one. Yep. So Um, Euchre is biggest in Canada with a little bit in a very few states. So even in Canada, it's mostly Ontario. So that there we have found the answer to your question, as far as I can tell, assuming that our chat room is smarter than we are. (laughs) Uh, Interestingly, I'm just sort of scanning through some quickly, some uh, some Vegas based news on the history of cards. Uh, And initially, the uh, the different uh, royalty were very specific people. Um, And so like the king of cards was for periods of time known as this person and right, the right. queen of hearts was this person. Uh, and so there was that, but that wasn't so much still, that was still more the theming of the deck as opposed right. to the game. Um, mm-hmm. The game, the games were something you did with the fun decks, but um, doesn't, uh, doesn't really seem to, to have that theme behind the games as much right. as, you know, war, obviously. I mean, it's, you know, mm-hmm. that's about as, as themed as you get, I guess. Yeah, I just kind of wondered. It's interesting. So uh, Tech did play some gin and rummy. That was popular. Those aren't trick-taking, but um, 
a theme can get in the way of a good trick taking game is Rogers view. So there we have the abstract gamer versus the uh, story gamers, both yep. with different views, which is great because that's why there are multiple games on the market. Not every game is for everyone. Um, played rummy from time to time with their dad. That's Pennywise. Um, uh, Domino's is, is, is and I, I would actually be interested to know um, if Domino's was something that got played in schools in some regions, because I know there's a oh, lot yeah, of definitely. like Domino's can be one of those hardcore games, but also well, that's a, gambling. Pennywise is saying Domino's is king down there. But, so. but, but Domino's is also one of those games that often involves a lot of betting and is one of those things that yeah. schools may try to dissuade people from playing because of those betting connections. Yeah. You don't see Domino's up here. Like it yeah. exists, but yeah, few people, my parents spent a few years, like, I don't know. They had, they had their Domino's phase. Where all of a sudden my parents discovered Mexican train and one other yep. way to play dominoes. And every time we went over, like, let's play cards, like, no, no, let's play dominoes. And I preferred cards. Yep. But that didn't last. They 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 ended up going back to cards. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's very it's also, I mean, you also you've also got um uh some of the the, the Chinese uh mahjong plays, yep. uh, you know, and, and things like that. It's it does seem there do definitely are some cultural roots to certain of these games. Uh I believe dominoes mm -hmm. and and I'm speaking without any actual data right in front of me, but I believe there is a strong uh, Hispanic um, yes. background between uh, in Domino's. Yeah, uh, I was going to say that that should be down south. I'm pretty sure that came yeah. up from Mexico. So, from what I understand, which probably goes back to Spain, would be my guess. Possibly. All right, a couple of comments from our Discord channel earlier today. So, Math Guy Dave pointed out all I ever played was Spades and Hearts with the math team. But again, he played Spades and Hearts with the math team. Oh, and Bridge instead of trig in Trigonometry class. Now, Bridge is a game I didn't even bother to try to learn to play. Yeah, never. And then I, I, De Burke is known for Euchre, but I've never played. I'm assuming De Burke is a school. Dubuque. I, Dubuque. Dubuque. Dubuque, okay. Or an area I don't actually know Dubuque. Sorry, Math Guy Dave. That's probably where Math Guy Dave's from. I feel feel bad here. Now his argument, and I think this may be true, and we kind of alluded this to a bit, and I think it's worth talking about, is in his opinion, phones have killed card games. That's why, as I've said before, many of my students don't know the suits anymore. So Math Guy Dave is a teacher, and his kids don't even know Heart Spades Clubs Diamonds, which to me just sounds weird. Like I'm sure, like Roger trying to teach people to play his euchre based ice game, and he's like. Bye bye, Meeple. <laughs> <laughs> like Roger trying to teach people to play his, his euchre based dice game, or and they're like, "What? What's a trick? And what what's that?" But yeah, people don't even know the the four suits. Which man, like I guess it, it probably happens, but it's, well, I mean, you know, times change. I mean, I I still I still think of it as a pound sign and not a hashtag. Um, yeah. You know, there there's there's things like that um, where where it's just you know that the things have have changed, and I mean, you know, a heart's a heart, but uh, what's you know what is a spade what's a, a spade what's a spade in a club right they don't uh yep. those don't have any real physical connection to us anymore so so jeff say he doesn't see phones killing cards i still think cards died before phones became common yeah and i well i think i think standard playing cards died before phones became common but again there was a drift towards some other the collectible uh, collectibles game. but also we were getting into some some non-phone games i mean there were digital games in you know handheld games out there oh, yeah yeah things the like game tamagotchi the even um, you know, yeah. little little digital games uh that were that you could pull out of your pocket and play that didn't require you know the handling and sorting and dealing with of cards yep. well here's a theory then I wonder if we only played cards because it was the only thing we had to do. We were bored and it was some way to pass time. And now there's a lot more options. You had your Tamagotchis, yep. you had your, your Game Boy, you had whatever, your, your, your phone eventually. I think that might just be it is, is they were presented with more options than cards. And you're like, wow, I can do something other than play a Euchre for the thousandth time. Yeah, no, I think there's also a definitely, um, you know, to play a game of Euchre, you need to have four people to sit mm. down or, you know, you could do open hands and things like that. But basically you needed four people to sit down and you needed to kind of at least sort of like at least one other one of them. Uh, whereas, you know, with a, a, a little video game, maybe you only needed one other person or maybe just yourself. Um, it wasn't as hard to get things going. Uh, and, you know, magic, you only need one other player to sit down and get a game of magic games. And sometimes, you know, at high school is a pain. Sometimes it can be hard to find three other people you want to deal sure. with, uh, especially on a regular ongoing basis. 
So, all right. So in the chat, what do you think? Do you think that, that we kind of cover things well enough? Yeah, I mean, there's a few other we're games they got the into place. there, and and uh, but uh, all over the place. But they, but I think definitely, uh, you know, Pennywise is agreeing. You know, portable video games uh, doesn't necessarily need to be a phone, but video games in various forms have slowly uh, invaded some of our time mm-hmm. that would have been play used to play those card games in the past. So kind of to summarize, I think, trying to get, catch from we were all over the place here. Uh, for one, it was just a distraction. Now there are more distractions out there. It is definitely seems that Euchre in particular is definitely regional. Uh, something that's definitely in Ontario and the, the Midwest is definitely where it comes from and where it's known from, especially in Michigan. So we have confirmed that as far as like with, with as much accuracy as we have, um, we've confirmed that. Um, and that, yes, it's people are playing it less and less as time goes on. And, and I might get to the point where it dies off, uh, that if, especially if kids these days don't know what a heart spade club and diamond are. And to be honest, I don't know if my kids do. I actually don't know either way because it, to me, um, I tend to enjoy games with a bit of story and a bit of background to them, kind of like Jeff in the chat room there. So I'm more likely to grab a thematic trick taking game or a thematic card game than, one that's uh, just using a standard deck of cards. And I, there's just something, I don't know, it's it's that and it's superiority feeling isn't the word for it, but just like, uh, those seem like simple games. I'd rather play something with a bit more meat to it, right? Just cause, But I think it's just a bias because that's what I grew up with. So yeah. because I grew up with it, I feel that it's simple just because I was able to play it as a kid, which isn't necessarily true. Like, like people wouldn't still be playing Euchre if there wasn't enough depth to that game to keep people interested for 80 years of their life. And so um, pointed out in the lobby that what we one thing we haven't done here is we haven't actually explained what a trick taking game is. Well, we'll leave that for people to discover on their own. No. <laughs> <laughs> so a trick taking game is a card game where or not necessarily card uh, domino. You can have dominoes trick taking games as well. But a, a game in which you play a, a set number of hands of uh, of whatever you're playing with uh, and you are the winner takes a collection from each hand uh, and generally, you know, again, generally take the, uh, the one with the most who has taken the most uh, or gained the most points from taking, taking those tricks wins. So uh, the trick is, is taking the, the victory of each hand. The other thing that is 99% common in almost every trick taking game, if not all of them is you have multiple suits of your cards multiple colors and usually one suit is dominant in a way um that's usually called the trump suit and part of it is when you lead a card so the first card played sets the suit for that round and everyone else has to follow and follow that suit play the same suit if you can't follow that suit you can throw off so you can throw a different suit whereas the trump if you throw the trump off it will take the suit it would win the suit even if it's not the highest number or highest card that's a, a huge part of trick taking so it's the combination of everyone plays a card and the highest card takes that trick so they get the points or whatever um the note in some trick taking games you don't want to take tricks but it's the the yeah, highest trick, trick avoidance games and trick taking games are sort of the yeah, uh, to me the they're the same game. thing they're still trick taking it's just you're forcing someone else to take the trick instead of you and good trick taking games in my opinion combine both um and that's why i like hearts is you can shoot the moon where you lose points for taking hearts but if you get all of them you get bonus points i love that aspect of trick taking but the general thing is you're gonna each play one card the first card led everyone has to follow that suit if you don't ha- and you have to follow and if you don't have that suit you can throw off when you throw off if you throw a trump it'll take a suit and you can lead trump and still the highest number will take it that's a generic thing now that's way easier to teach in person it's, it's a little hard to describe, but if I had a deck of cards, I can show it to you in seconds. Yeah. Like it's, it's really simple to teach the basic premise of trick taking. And as I said, we just did this the other day, actually. We, we just taught my oldest daughter played her first trick taking game. One of the games we're going to review later tonight, and she was able to pick it up really quick. Now the strategy is where she had a hard time of what, when do I want to trick a trick? When do I want to play Trump? When do I not? And well, that's the stuff people have been trying to perfect in games like Euchre for a hundred or more, well, more, way more than a hundred years. Yeah. And if you, if you want to understand just how difficult it is, just check Wikipedia for trick taking games and you'll see that there is a whole lot to it. It's not just as yeah. simple as, you know, you, you play the cards and, and somebody wins and moves on. There's, there's, there's a lot of depth it's variant to the, yeah. the, concept of trick-taking games 
So we're going to take a look at uh, some of those. Yeah, so I think we covered everything pretty well. Um, I think we're good to go. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to modern trick-taking games. I personally still recommend playing the originals. I, I, like I said, I love sp Spades and Hearts are my two favorite. Hearts, again, the neat trick in Hearts. Is, uh, the neat trick. Uh, the neat thing in Hearts is that the, the red, the Hearts are worth negative points. But if you get all of them, you get bonus points. That's that's a really rough overview. There's also something to do with spades and whatever. The, 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 it matter as well in jacks and stuff. But anyway, the other one is spades. And what I like in spades is you have to bid how many tricks you're going to take every round. So it's a matter of you get your hand, you look at your hand and go, okay, with these cards, I'm going to take seven out of the 13 tricks. And you get points for getting it right, and you lose points for getting it wrong. And those are my two favorites. Now, there are others, but those are the two I like the most. So what we're going to do now is move past the games that have been around for hundreds of years and move into some modern trick-taking games. Games that take those original concepts of Euchre, Spades, Hearts, and do new things with them and take them to new places. As usual, this list is in no specific order, and at the end we'll have a few honorable mentions. All right, number one, this is, I say it's in no order, but this is probably still the top of the list, I got to say, is The Fox in the Forest. This is a two-player only trick-taking game we mentioned a number of times on the show. I'm not going to repeat everything we said in the past, but as noted before, the biggest thing with this game is it shocked me that it works because it's two players only. Like I, growing up, always think of trick-taking games as four players, either four players exactly or two teams of two. Never as something that would work with only two players. And the Fox in the Forest proved me wrong completely. Yeah, and we've talked about this uh, plenty of times on the show of late, so we'll move on. But again, this was the Fox in the Forest. And then, of course, the follow-up would be the fact that while I was surprised the Fox in the Forest worked, I was even more surprised by the follow-up game, the Fox in the Forest duet. This took the original trick-taking game and made it a cooperative game. Like, this is the first cooperative two-player game I've discovered that works this well. It is a fantastic two-player experience. And again, how does trick-taking game work cooperative and they manage to do it? This has become one of our go-to date night games for Deanna and I. When we're when it's just the two of us, it takes up a little small footprint. They're just a board in the cards. And man, is it good. The only problem is you play in silence. So depending on what you want from your date night game, you may not want it for that if you want to socialize while playing. Yeah, the, the lack of talking can be uh, good or bad, again, depending on relationships <laughs> and how the rest of the week went. But either way, that is Fox in the Forest duet. Next, I have Diamonds. Now, again, I just mentioned this earlier. My two favorite trick-taking games are Hearts and Spades. There is another one called Clubs that I actually never played. I still love Hearts and Spades, and I thought it was fascinating that it's in my lifetime, like recently, that someone invented diamonds that for years went by that no one had made a game based on the diamonds suit of cards. This is published by Stronghold Games and is the, the logical follow-up to Hearts, Spades, and Clubs. What Diamonds does that I like, for one, is it breaks that four-player mold right away. You can play six players. I don't know, at the time, I didn't know any other big player count trick-taking games so that was great then it has some neat hidden information mechanics where you have this little vault and you're holding how many gems you've collected and then it also has some really neat mechanics for playing off suit so if you play off suit with different cards different things happen where you're stealing gems and moving them to vaults and stuff like that it's way more fiddly than most traditional card games and it does require more than a standard deck of cards but i think this is a great next step so for people who like hearts and spades to give them more of a almost a euro experience of like moving around resources while you're playing i think this is a good next step for a trick taking game right and so uh, unlike uh, you know a betting trick uh, game this is similar but it's a a, a in-game resource rather than yes. having to worry about uh, anting up and leaving without your wallet at the end of the night and that is and trust me if you wanted to play for money it's really easy each gem's a buck or five bucks or a penny and that was diamonds all right, next is Wizard. This is the hobby card game that's closest to playing a standard trick card. Trick, yeah. Wizard is a hobby card game that is closest to playing a trick-taking game with a standard deck. Now, it does have a special deck. It's a little bit different, but this is probably the most approachable game on the list for playing with people who are hardcore standard card game fans. This is the one that if my parents were open to playing a new card game, I would break this one out. This is a bidding game similar to spades where you're going to bid for how many tricks you're going to take. But the brilliant thing wizard does is you actually start off with one card. 
So you do a one card hand. And the first card is, are you going to take the trick or not? Yes or no. And then you have a two card hand. You can take one tricks, two tricks or none. Then it's a three card hand. Then a four card hand up to, I think the max is 13 or 18. And I can't remember what. And then you get points for being right. You lose points for being wrong. I think that is a fantastic. It is my favorite bidding version of bidding on your tricks. And why is it called wizard? Uh, there is like one of the suits or like there's a wizard or a joker. I, to be honest, I don't remember. It's been a long time since <laughs> I played wizard. Uh, first time I played wizard was at a great Canadian board game blitz. So it, it's, and I was really impressed and I'm like, okay, I need to get a wizard deck now. All right. Well, that was wizard. Uh, next is one. This is a lesser known. This is the hidden gem on our list. This is black spy. This is for fans of hearts. If you want to, you, you have someone who's a hardcore fan of hearts, pick this one out. This is an evolution of hearts. It's played with a uh, played using pretty much standard trick taking rules. But the thing is only the black cards are worth points with the two black spy cards being worth the most. This is another one that's just that little bit different from a traditional game to make it a little more interesting and throwing just a little bit of a theme on there. But I think it's another one that's great as a next step for traditional card gamers. All right, and that is Black Spy. Talking about throwing a theme on a game, Gorus Maximus splatters it all over the place. Uh, the highlight of this gladiatorial combat-based trick-taking game is two things, I would say. First off, you can play a huge number of people. Like, I think it goes up to eight players. Eight players for a trick-taking game is phenomenal in a way because it's great for those nights where you want everyone to play at the same table together instead of splitting off into two groups of four. Then it's the fact that the trump can change mid-hand by playing a similar card, same number as the person beside you. Added to that is a really unique point-based system uh, of numbers on the various cards that include some negative point values. So this is one of the ones where you're going to take a trick and then you're going to add up how much it's worth. And you could score negative points because some of the cards are punitive. Now, I think that is a really fascinating way where the, I think I've got a great trick and then someone throws that bad card in there. Like it, it, it's a great example to me of a modern trick-taking game where it uses that basic mechanics and lever layers on new things to keep it fresh. Just watch for that not so kid friendly art. Right. And they do have a uh, follow up coming out that has got a, uh, a non or yeah. that is a kid friendly uh, sea change is their follow up that has a much more family friendly art set. But we are talking about Gorus Maximus, which is just a fantastic game. Yeah, it's, it's really solid. All right, the last game I've got on the list tonight, you can't quite get yet. This is launching on Kickstarter later this month. And I seriously, if you are a fan of trick taking games, watch for this one. Um, I don't really promote Kickstarters all that often. No, I'm not being paid to promote this Kickstarter, but I think it's going to be worth backing. And that's Macaron. We're going to be doing a full review of this trick taking game later in the show. And what I will say here that the neat new thing it does is a voting system to determine Trump and a system that makes one of the suits unfavorable every turn. They call this the allergen suit. And what happens is if you get any allergens in with your cards, they're worth no points that round. And that was Macaron. All right, up next, we are going to move on to three honorable mentions. Now, uh, people who joined us for the pre-show live on Twitch night already got a little spoiler on this one. The number one game on my honorable mentions today is Tichu. I think that's how it's pronounced, T-I-C-H-U. This is the game that when I did research for this episode was at the top or near the top of every top trick-taking game list out there for hobby board games. That technically spades, euchre, and hearts tended to be on the top when you're looking at traditional card games. I figure this probably belongs on the main list, like for the amount of people that seem to love this game, except I've never actually gotten a chance to play it. So if anyone local, and I know we have some people in the chatter from Windsor, I have a copy of Teach You. I would love to try it. Earlier today, we just checked. It's not on Board Game Arena. I would love to give this one a try to see what the fuss is about. Teach You, T-I-C-H-U. Everyone seems to love this. Haven't had a chance to play it myself. It is ranked 160th overall on Board Game Geek. So that's pretty big. Yeah, and it's been out since 1991. I mean, it's it's ah. it's a classic. And that was Teach You. Next is Trick of the Rails. Now I threw this one on the list because it's the one I'm most curious about. Out of all the trick taking games I looked over in the last three days doing research for this episode, this supposedly combines an 18xx style portfolio management 
your whole stock trading and buying train routes with trade taking. And I got to say that fascinates me. Like this is one of the heaviest weighted trick taking games out there. And no, it's not a four. It's like a 2.75, but for a trick taking game, that's really high. And I am really curious to try a heavy trick taking game. I want to know what they could do with this one. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if uh, 2.3 really counts as heavy, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll see. So that that is, is, compare that to Euchre and Spades. And then that's why I mean by heavy. That is trick of the rails. All right, the final one is the one our chat room's been yelling at us since we finished the uh, the main list, and that is The Crew, The Quest for Planet Nine. Uh, this is what I would consider the new hotness in trick-taking. Everyone is talking about this cooperative trick-taking game. Um, after playing Fox in the Forest duet, I'm super hyped to see someone else do a cooperative trick-taking game and see what they do with it. Um, this one even has a campaign element where you go through progressively harder missions and the base box comes with 50 missions and they've already talked about more coming. This sounds fantastic, but I don't have a copy. I haven't had a chance to play it. This is one I think I probably would have seen at the local game store had things not been as messed up as they are this year. And unfortunately, I just don't have a contact to get a review copy of this one. But I got to say the crew looks fantastic. It probably belongs on the main list. But again, I haven't played it myself. And I mean, we're talking about an 8.0 rating with 9,000 yeah. ratings, 58th overall in BGG and number three in family games. Wow. That's, that's big. That's that the is crew, big. the quest for planet nine released 2019 uh, and Cosmos actually as one of the publishers. Sure, on it's that. Cosmos. Yes. You know what? I was supposed to get a copy of that. But Unfortunately, Cosmos is no longer shipping to Canada, so we will not be reviewing any more Cosmos games. So yes, that is one I asked for. I knew I asked someone for that one. Yeah, it looks fantastic. I, I got to say, it looks great. Uh, that one is on Board Game Arena, so we probably should sit down and try yeah. it at some point. Absolutely. But card games, like, oh, even more so, <laughs> I feel like I want the cards in my hands. But fair enough. Well, that's it for our discussion on trick-taking games. We're going to head over to the lobby now and see if anyone in our chat room has any other games to add that we missed. All uh, right, so we have everyone telling us to check out. We got like five different people telling us to check out the crew. The, yeah. the, the, the crew. So we're going to have to check out the crew one way or another. Uh, Jeff's even offered to lend it to us, so that might be cool. Um, what I will ask Jeff is to play well two players, because that I'm assuming if Jeff has it, it probably plays well two players. But that is the biggest uh, thing I would be worried about. Now, Community says have two to five, else? best at four. Best at four, yeah. So that's a little rough. Though we do have extended family to play with. It is. I mean, it's not like it's not recommended at five, two. It's just best at well pennywise is saying not a fan at two so oh, okay. sounds like we may need more so again i have the chat open but i haven't been watching it what do we have that people have recommended that we missed uh, i did see some I comments think... mentioning what they thought of what we talked about mm. indulgence from restoration games that is one i've seen the cover of and that's all i know i didn't even know that was a trick-taking game uh jeff sue strongly recommends whist now this is another classic though so uh, he's saying most trick-taking games today are just whist with different scoring methods, different numbers of hands, and different ways to determine trump. So uh, Indulgence is a re-implementation of Coup d'Etat or Dragon oh, Master. Oh, that was one of my parents' favorite games. I have a copy of Coup d'Etat downstairs. So that's what Indulgence is, is a re-implementation of oh, that. very cool. Restoration you know what? I, I got that. My parents used to play Coup d'Etat two to three times a year with a local family. They would play games of Coup d'Etat, and then they would play a full round of Mahjong. And I got my dad's copy and I haven't had a chance to actually play it. It's been downstairs. It's on the pile of shame. So yeah, I would actually like to try coup d'etat and it's cool to know that's back. Like my parents were huge fans of coup d'etat. Right. Uh, Rook, I know of, uh, again, I know of it because I share deals on it on Amazon all the time. Well, and, and I mean, Rook, about it. Rook is a hundred years old. <laughs> yeah, Rook's, Rook again is probably not a modern. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure there are modern game. printings of it, but I mean, that, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's 1900s, <laughs> early 1900s. I wonder how, I wonder if restoration improved it much or if it's, if it's close to the original. Okay. Now I, now I'm tempted. I got I'm going to have to break out my parents' copy of Coup d'Etat and get that played sooner rather than later. Later. Crew plays okay with two, but with a variant. So there you go. So that, that's another thing that's going to keep us away from the crew right now someday we will be able to gather again and we will play the crew well and, and you know what maybe tomorrow uh we may our our, our normal thursday night plans may get uh, goofed up so maybe we could try a three-player on bga and yeah. if that uh if that falls through so that's all i'm seeing from the chat right now are you ready to move on uh, i think so 
I think we caught most of it while we were doing the actual discussion. Thank you again, everyone who took part tonight. That was a, a fantastic amount of interaction. As always, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Let's take a look at the fast-playing card game, Ratuki. First off, thanks for tossing this game in with some review copies we had required. We we had acquired. We weren't expecting this one, and we appreciate it. Yep, thanks the op. All right, Ratuki was created by Greg Zima. Now, this is a card game for two to five players. It's a lightning quick game with each round lasting maybe five minutes and a full game taking well under half an hour. Now, this was originally published by Schmidt Spiel in 2009. Since then, there have been editions from Hasbro, Magellan, and more. The most recent edition, the one I'm reviewing tonight, is from the Op or USAopoly. For a look at what you get in this co in a copy of this small box game, check out our Ratuki unboxing video on YouTube. So basically, what you have here is a box of cards split over five identical decks, each in a different color, with the decks containing cards going from one to five, represented in a bunch of different ways. There's numerals, tick marks, the words for the numbers, a hand holding up a number of fingers, and pips on the side of a six-sided die. There's also a set of instructions and five reference cards. Certainly straightforward enough, though I can see how the varied types of numbering are just enough to slow <laughs> down players compared to just having all one type of numbers. Now, to start a game of Ratuki, it's dead simple. There's almost no setup. You just take one of the five decks, shuffle it, and draw three cards. Someone shouts Ratuki, and the game starts. Now, all players play simultaneously. You're going to play one card from your one hand to the table using your other hand. And that's actually important how you're holding the cards. Cards played must be played into stacks on the table with the maximum number of stacks being the number of players playing. To start a stack, you start with a Ratuki card, which each deck has two, or a one. Each card played after that has to be either one higher or one lower than the card on the top of a stack. When a player plays a five to the top of a stack, they say Ratuki and take that entire pile of cards and place them in their scoring area. In addition, players can also play a Ratuki card on the top of any stack, say Ratuki and claim that stack. Finally, if a player can't play any of the cards in their hand, they have the option to discard that card to their trash pile. Then they immediately draw one more card. When they run out of cards in the draw deck, they just flip over their trash pile and it becomes a new draw deck. The round ends when one player plays their last card or when it's clear no one can play any more cards because of the piles currently in play. At the end of each round, players get points. This is pretty simple. One for one for every card in your scoring pile, minus any cards you have left. Game ends when a player surpasses 100 points with the player with the most points winning. Now, there are some simple rules that have to be followed while doing this. That's the, the really basic part. One of the things is you can't play cards with both hands. One card has to hold your cards and the other has to play them. You can only play one card at a time, and after it's played, you have to draw a new one. So don't go and bang, bang, bang. You got to go bang and draw and put it in your hand and bang and draw and put it in your hand. You can only have a number of center stacks equal to the number of players. And if two players try to play the same on the same stack at exactly the same time, both players are actually penalized for competing for it and have to trash those two cards. So unless I'm missing something here, there is an aspect of pure speed to mm -hmm. this. Uh, if you can mentally and physically play faster than your opponents, you have the advantage. It is definitely all about speed. Whether whether that's speed of thought or speed of moving your hands, it is definitely. This is closest to games like Spoons. Now, for me checking out this game, right from looking at the box, I knew this was going to be one of those super quick, simple to learn games that's going to be good for a light game night. Probably great for playing non with non-gamers and possibly great for a game night with adult beverages. And I got to say, Ratuki is definitely all of these. This is one of those games where you can be up and playing in minutes. The rules are extremely simple to teach and understand, though I do recommend at least the first time you play with someone, do a quick, simple round before you start keeping track of score, just to make sure everyone has the full concept. Uh, those little rules about only using one hand, always making sure you draw and reminders about the ties are also useful to make sure everyone's got those. Now, the other problem though, is there's also potential confusion with the rules in this particular version of Ratuki from the op, because the rules seem to be missing the section on how to end a round. Now, while it should be obvious that you stop when someone's out of cards or when you can't play anymore, that's not actually stated anywhere. 
Plus, you don't know if it's when everyone runs out of cards or if it's when one person runs out of cards. Where the proper rule is when one person runs out of cards, you stop. Yeah, indeed. I managed to find a copy of the Hasbro rule print sheet that, yeah. while similar, had additional rule, an additional rule, one specific additional line that was missing from the op version. Yeah, I think this isn't actually an errata. This is, uh, I think they meant to include it in there. But again, you're going to figure it out. Like, you're going to get to the end of the first round and go, well, I guess we stop now. It wasn't over. It wasn't game breaking in any way. Now, besides that small rulebook omission, I didn't find anything really to dislike about Ratuki. It's a simple, fast playing card game that worked great with um, all adults and with one of my kids. Uh, sadly, the youngest wasn't interested in trying. My extended family loves it. It's one of those super fast, furious, fun with just enough thinking to make it interesting where it's not, you know, 52 card pickup or war. There's, there's definitely some thought required. Yeah. I can definitely see my kids enjoying this one. It's the same sort of game like Uno and others that are the right level of competitive, but you've also got that speed factor. So mm -hmm. it's not just round the table. You know, you've got to keep thinking fast. Overall, I think this is a great gateway game. Uh, this is perfect for introducing people who dig card games in general uh, to more hobby games. I also think this is a good one for non-gamers. This is so simple to pick up. This is the kind of thing you can get your parents playing, get grandma to, well, depends how quick grandma is. Um, bring it out to a, a pub or something like that and get going. It's fast, furious, quite fun. Um, what I like this one for is building the energy level. I like to start with this. Like you get this going and everyone, you know, your heart's pumping. You're trying to play things quick and be that. And it gets people starting to interact. I think it's a great first step, first game of the night. I even think hardcore gamers are going to enjoy this one again as a starter to get things ramped up, to get people energized, but also as a filler to take up time between games or to relax your brain a bit before moving on to heavier games. Overall, uh, as a family, we've had quite a bit of fun with Ratuki. I think it's a great choice if you're looking for, you know, a nice, quick, light, easy to play card game that's very accessible to gamers of all experience levels. Plus, it does have the advantage of playing up to five, which is a little higher than your standard card game. Well, for a slightly more in-depth look at Ratuki, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Welcome to a preview of Macaron, a modern trick-taking card game launching soon on Kickstarter. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Sunrise Tornado Game Studio for providing us with a review copy of this game. All right, Macaron was designed by... Tata Wu and features art by Holly Chu and Richard Kim. I do apologize if I got those name pronunciations wrong. This is going to be published by Sunrise Tornado Game Studio. Uh, assuming it's it funded, it's expected to hit Kickstarter later this year, possibly later this month if everything goes as smoothly. This card game plays one to five players with each game taking about half an hour. I would actually say less once people know the, the full mechanics. Uh, the somewhat pasted on theme here is that players are patissiers in French making macaron gift boxes for King Louis' birthday. Due to the fact that the version of macaron we received is a pre-production copy and does not feature final artwork or components, we did not re uh, record an unboxing video. I do believe that it is on Tabletopia, however, though. Yes, it is. Yep, they, that is part of the ways that they are doing previews of. Now, the components we did receive that I think are going to stay the same are four group boards that are showing one or two macaron types, a central playing board that includes a score track, a bidding track, and a place to track the number of gift box completed by each player each round. There are going to be 52 cards that are split over seven suits. Six of these suits have cards numbered one to seven. The final suit, the chocolate macaron, has cards from one to ten. There are 14 voting tokens, which include one start player token, a marker to match which suits are royal, which is uh, the term for Trump in this game, and which flavor is the allergen. More about the actual mechanics of that later. Now, player components. Now, interestingly, my copy only had enough for four players. Include a betting token, a score token, and a completed box token. Again, what I have are prototypes. I have meeples. I am certain the game is probably not going to come with meeples. So now that we have an idea of what you get, how about you tell us how to play this modern trick-taking card game? All right, so this one is more than you would expect from a trick-taking card game. Like this is, there's there's definitely some complexity and granularity and, and fiddliness to this game. So it's going to take a little bit more to explain than most trick-taking games. So to start the game, 
you are going to first have to adjust the number of suits, which is the flavors of macarons based on the number of players. You're also going to pick which side of the main board to use. Basically, there's an easy and an advanced side. The advanced side is for longer games that a higher score, and it adds more granularity to the bidding phase, which again, I'll get to that in a minute. So is that a bit like using the, uh, the easy and hard uh, sides of Azul, uh, where it's not a hugely different game, but it adds a little bit more difficulty uh, into, into the, the play? Yeah, I would say so. Especially the, the main thing is if you want to play a long game, you have to use the advanced board because the scoring track's longer. And like I said, it does add a little bit more granularity to a couple of the phases, which I'll describe in a bit. Not a huge change, though. It definitely doesn't feel like playing a different game. Starting a round, you're going to shuffle the deck and the cards are dealt evenly to all players. Now, if you're playing four or more players, you're going to also distribute the voting tokens evenly. Players are then going to look at their cards and pass two cards to one of their opponents, starting with passing to the left and passing to the right. People have seen this in many trick-taking games over the years. This is nothing new. Once everyone has their hands, their final hands, it's time to determine what the royal group is and the allergen. Now, these are unique concepts to this game in a way. With less than four players, it's really simple. Player to the left of the start player picks the royal group, and the player to the left of them picks the allergen. Now, with two players, note that would go back to the start player. Now, with four or five players, this is where it gets neat, is there's a voting round to make this determination. Now, voting is done with these little voting chips, which are played one at a time in player order. They're placed above or below a specific macaron flavor, with votes above a flavor counting as positive and votes below being negative. Now, after everyone's voted, you flip all your chips over and you do the math. Now, the group of macarons, which are in pairs, that has the highest total, with it, once you've done all the math, becomes the royal group. Then the individual flavor, not group, with the lowest total becomes the allergen. Okay, that's... Yeah, well, I mean, it's a, it's a flavorful concept to throw into a, a trick-taking game about food, so... Now, players do get one final option before the round starts. Now that they know the allergen, they know the royal group, they can bid on how many completed boxes of macarons they will make during the game, during the round, sorry. At the end of the round, they're going to get bonus points if they're right, and they're going to lose points if they're wrong. Note the bet's optional. So this isn't like, say, spades or wizards, where you have to bet how many tricks you're going to take. Also note that these are only completed boxes. We'll get to why that matters in a minute because not every trick you take is going to score for you. So playing around a macaron, you are playing a trick taking game. Starting with the start player, continuing clockwise, everyone's going to play one card. The first card led determines the suit, the flavor for that hand. Every card played after that has to follow the suit if possible. And the highest card played wins the trick. If a player can't follow suit, they can throw off suit. Non-royal offsuit cards can't win a trick. They're just tossed. Cards from a royal group, though, will steal the trick with the highest royal card winning the trick. Okay. Now, in addition to this, one of the suits is the allergen. That was determined during that voting round. Any trick taken with an allergen is going to be worth no points because that box of macaron is spoiled by the allergen. Finally, ones and twos are special. So again, every deck goes only from one to seven, except the chocolate goes one to 10. Well, a two negates the allergens present, even if the two comes from the allergen suit. That way, even if there are negative cards there, it's still worth points to you. And a one is worth three completed boxes instead of ones if the one takes the trick. Okay, so... It's not, I mean, there's a lot there. There's a lot to unpack, but it, it does make a lot of sense. The allergen uh, certainly makes a lot of sense. You, you decided mm -hmm. the allergen of the king, and if the king is allergic to it, he's not going to like the box, so exactly. you waste the entire box. Yep, all makes sense. It's, it's actually, I was impressed by how well they tied in theme. Uh, something we were talking about earlier on in the podcast episode where we were featuring this review was that most trick-taking games don't have a lot of theme, and it was cool to see one that did. Yep. Now, once players have played all their cards, note, you do play every card. Um, you're going to play with a standard four or five player game. You're going to play 13 cards. Sorry, four player game. You're going to play 13 cards, 13 rounds. You're then going to count up your completed boxes. So those are the ones without allergens in them with a bonus for your ones. Then you're going to get points based on the boxes completed. Now, this isn't one to one. It's not like getting seven tricks that are completed seven points. This is important because like you actually get more points for getting zero tricks than you do for getting one or two tricks. So what you do is you're going to look up on a, on the board and put your meeple on the spot. And then you're going to look in a column and see how many points you get. 
So for example, um, on the easy side of the board, completing three, four, or five boxes is all just worth three points. Whereas again, the advanced side is a little more granular. Only four and five boxes will get you three points. Right. Now a standard game of Macaron ends when one player hits 10 points with the player with the most points at that point winning the game. The game also presents the option to play to 20 or 30 points using that advanced side of the scoreboard. In addition to these rules, there are a full set of solo rules that uses a bot player called Emma. Uh, not not a huge fan of bot players to uh, to play solo, but you know what? Especially these days, there's a lot of drive out there for solo games. So good side. Now, it's, it's interesting that, you know, if on your basic side, you play to 10, you can only play those longer games on the advanced. Is there anything stopping you from just looping around again on the on the on the scoring track on the simple game no okay not really i like i don't see any reason to and, and i actually the the base board if i remember actually goes up to 20 because again the, the game ends when someone gets to 10 but you could go more than 10 right right at 10 it's whoever has the most points right so i don't know i it, it's it, i don't see any reason why not you could loop we found a 10 point game was just long enough and enough that now we want to play another 10 pointed game. Okay. Well, like I, I can't see wanting to play a 20 or 30. I think I would rather play three 10 point games than one 30 point game. That was at least the feeling we got in the multiple plays we had. Okay. That's good. Good to know. Now, overall thoughts in general, I like trick taking games. I've, I've been playing them as long as I can remember. And I'm always excited to see something new done with this tried and true card game mechanic. And that, to be honest, is what got me to agree to check out this new game. Because Sunrise Tornado got a hold of me on Instagram, and I'm like, oh, okay, another trick-taking game. That's so much better than just another Cards Against Humanity knockoff. Thank you for at least offering something interesting. And then I looked at their webpage. I think it was a Facebook page they sent me to, and I'm like, ooh, this actually looks kind of neat. And I dug into a bit, and I'm like, this looks like it does some stuff that's different. So I wanted to check it out. And the two things that really set this apart from other trick-taking games is the voting system for the Royal Group and that whole addition of the allergen, uh, a punitive suit that changes every round. Well, may or may not change every round. Yeah, no, and that, that's the, uh, the way that, that, uh, that loss, that the negative uh, mm -hmm. changes is nice. I mean, you know, we've got games like uh, Gorus Maximus where the, the Royal changes uh, mid, mid hand even. Mid hand, uh, yes. Whereas, whereas the, the punitive isn't something that normally shifts. So they've, they've sort no. of, swap that uh the negative moving around as opposed to the positive yep yeah i really enjoyed that voting system actually like that whole determining the royal group and the allergen round like that's really neat like there are some hard to make decisions like this is one of those where you're staring at your hand going oh man i don't know what should i do and then like you're doing this after you pass to your opponent right so there's another level of you know what two of the cards your opponent has and then your opponent on this side knows what two of your cards are right like there's that whole level like there's a lot of information going in while doing that bid and then once it goes around the table once you're seeing where other people have bid and that's going to make you think even like you're adding another level the the, the brain is spreading out and branching going, Oh wait, they bid on purple. Why'd they bid on purple? Does that mean they have lots of purples? What am I going to do? And, and that is really interesting. And then there's the extra level that the Royal is a Royal group. So in most cases, it's actually two of the suits you're voting on two of the flavors because only the chocolates on its own. So I thought that was fascinating because three of the five groups have two different flavors in them. So I'm like, and then, there's the additional rule, which I didn't actually mention earlier, but the allergen flavor can be part of the royal group. So your allergen could also be Trump, which is going to be really hard to not get stuck with those because Trump's going to take tricks you don't want it to take. And I think that's really fascinating. Like there's just so many little things going on in this game. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, the biggest problem with Macaron is the parts I love are in the voting system. And that only exists if you play with four or five players. Like, well, the game's written to play with less, right? And there's even solo rules using Emma. I found you really want at least four people to, to, to get the fun, like to do the thing that's neat in this game. You really need that. I don't think the person on your left just picking a royal group and then the person on their left picking an allergen is nearly as cool as the whole voting thing. It, like, like, you're just losing out. Like, to me, I, I get it. I understand why they want to market for small groups, especially nowadays. 
I almost say this is a four player only trick taking game. I don't think I would, if I'm down to less players, if I only have two players, I'm going to grab a Fox in the forest. If I only have one player, I'm going to play something like Friday. If I had three players, I'm sure I can't think of one off the top. Maybe I grab Goros Maximus or something. It's just, this isn't what I'm going to rush to, but once I hit four or five and then we get to have that voting round, that's when this game shines. All right. Well, good to know. And I mean, I, it's tough. Like even Goris Maximus, uh, you want we, more, we want the more, you know, the fact that it plays up to eight players is awesome because those big games of, of Goris are, were, were where the fun was really at. Yes, I agree. Now the other potential issue I see with this game is that as I just described it, like there's a lot going on. There's a lot of little things and there's tokens and markers and you're bidding and there's voting. Like that is a lot of stuff going on for a trick taking game, right? Like this is so much more than hearts or spades where all you need is a standard deck of playing cards and some way to track score. Like you're looking at way more stuff here. What's Royal? What's the allergen and a marker to mark those. So it's easy to see all of that just means this probably is not a gateway trick taking game. This is definitely not one that I am going to introduce someone to trick taking to where possible, though I did that with my daughter, which is part of why I think this is a problem when I say a problem, but it's, it's a thing. And I don't even know if this is a good next step for traditional card game players. Like, I think I'd rather pull out a wizard or a diamonds before breaking this one out. If I'm playing with someone who I'm like, what's your gaming experience? Like, hey, I played Monopolies and Hearts. I'm like, I think I might want to leave Macron in the box for a little bit. Like, this is just more complicated than what you'd expect from, oh, it's a simple card game. This is definitely not just a simple card game. Right. Now, despite the fact I have a preview copy of the game, I got to say I was pleased with the design work that I saw. Again, this may not be finalized, but as far as I know, the card design is. Besides featuring some really appealing looking art, it looks delicious. There's a lot of helpful information on the cards. Uh, that for, for one, make the game colorblind accessible and easier to differentiate between the cards. For one, the numbers are clear, like the, the big one through seven is huge. Uh, each suit's artwork and the overall color of each suit is unique, so you can tell them apart by color. But in addition to that, there are small unique symbols for each suit showing the flavor. So like a blueberry for the blueberry and a, a pistachio for the pistachio. And then they even put a letter on each card group, which is especially useful when trying to figure out which can cards in your hand are royal. Once you've determined the royal group, well, there's a thing showing which group each of them are in. Now, I will admit the chocolate and the almond suits could have been differentiated a bit more. In your hand, it's fine, but across the table, they do look a little bit similar. But overall, I was really impressed. Well, and it's always good to see these companies, you know, taking that extra step and looking for ways to make as many people as possible able to play the game, mm -hmm. whether they be, uh, you know, dyslexic or uh, you know vision vision issues or whatever the the issue is giving them those options to 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 make that game accessible mm -hmm. is always fantastic no i totally agree so overall i think it's pretty obvious i really enjoyed back room like this is way more fun than i thought it was going to be when i signed up i'm like yeah, it'll be a trick taking game. i'm like no this is a good trick taking game like i would honestly say this is better than many of the other modern trick taking games i've played in the last few years um, we mentioned a couple tonight already. Yes, there's more going on, and that might be a problem for people new to trick-taking or playing the first modern trick-taking game after coming from especially the classics. I think that's what I like about it, though, that there is so much meat to this. There is so many interesting things happening. Yes, every round of this is going to take longer than a round of Euchre, for sure, but like things like that voting system and everything that goes along with it adds a new level of strategy and tactics to a traditional trick taking game. And I've found I really enjoyed that. It's just a shame that those voting rules only come into play when you play with four or five players. Like I'm wondering if someone out there before this is funded, maybe can come up with a two or three player voting variant or something just to keep that bit of meat into the game. If you're a longtime fan of trick-taking games like me, I honestly think you should check this one out. Like, watch for this to go live on Kickstarter. I'm a big fan already. I Trust me, when it goes live, I'm going to be sharing it on my socials so people know it's live. If you like card games in general and don't mind trick-taking games, you're like, eh, I like card games. Trick-taking is okay. I would recommend giving this a spin. Give, try it out. Maybe play it on Tabletopia to give it a play before you actually dive in. I think there's a lot here to like. Now, if you're not familiar with trick-taking games at all, or if you have very little experience with them, I would actually caution you to stay away from this one for now. 
go out, find some other modern trick-taking games, try them, try some diamonds, try a, a fox in the forest, try a few other games to see if you dig that style of play. And if you do, then come back and take a look at Macaron. And the, we've got an Ask episode just about modern trick-taking games that you're welcome to take a look at our <laughs> list from. Now, for a somewhat more in-depth look at Macaron, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Uh, and I see we've had a little bit of chat in the lobby. Before we move on to our weekend review, uh, especially people talking about how yummy this game looks. <laughs> yeah, it does. I really got to say, one of the things they offer, and I thought this was kind of silly, is you can get two different card backs. I decided to go with the tree version myself, but you could also get the shelf. So mine is like a tiered... Um, a pastry tiered, you know, triangle type thing with all these macarons on it. You could instead get these rows and rows of macaron. And I personally didn't care because I knew it wouldn't affect gameplay. And I'm like, send me whatever you have more of, right? <laughs> so, so you don't have an abundance of one left over at the end. And I say like, people are saying, yes, the, the art looks tasty. Um, game sounds pretty good. People aren't sure about the bot player in a trick-taking game. I will admit, I did not. I probably should have sat down and played the solo game. But just reading it, it just seemed fiddly. And it was like, if this is here, then Emma does this. And if Emma does that, I'm like, and I, you don't get the vote. And that's the neat thing. I'm like, ah, eh, to me, I don't know. Like, that that's the disappointing thing about this game is I honestly think they should have just made a four-player game. And I get it. A four-player game isn't going to sell to as many people as a one-to-five-player game is. And five, which might be fine. Again, my I didn't have the components to play five. And yes, I could have scavenged some other games around my game room to get me the components to play five. I wonder, but I wasn't going to do that. I wonder if... Um, I'm, I'm not actually familiar that familiar with Tabletopia. Uh, I wonder if they have a scripting... Like I know you can do a lot of scripting in Tabletop yeah. Simulator. If you can script the solo play in tabletopia so that all that fiddliness is taken care of by the computer in a real bot format. Um, that would certainly, I think tabletopia is more of a platform, like more mm -hmm. hands off, but I'm right. not positive. And I don't know if Roger's still in our chat. He might be able to say more about tabletopia because I know he was using it, but then switched to tabletop simulator. So yeah, I'm not sure. I, like, I know tabletop simulator. You can do quite a lot of programming if you yeah. really dive into it. Uh, and I'm just not familiar with, with tabletopia. All right. Yes, uh, Evil John, we're going to leave the final comment that he's worried about buying this game because I would try to eat the game. <laughs> so, yes, I, I totally get that. Uh, this, this There's another topic for us someday. I don't think we're going to do it. It's more of an AMA question. Games you want to eat. Uh, there includes... was actually a Twitter conversation uh, oh, yesterday, maybe two days ago. Uh, the question was, what board game would you most want to eat if it was turned into edible components? Go. Uh, I actually pulled out my Romper Room Gingerbread Man board game from okay. 1973. Uh, go look it up. It's actually on Board Game Arena. It's wow. Romper Room Gingerbread Man game. Uh, and uh, I had someone who who said, "I'm there. Uh, don't ever invite me to your home. Your heirlooms are not safe because this is actually, <laughs> you know, this game has been in my family for three generations now, basically. Right. Nice. So uh, it, uh, it it can look a little tasty other than the fact that the plastic is a little on the glossy side. There you go. Yeah, Pennywise is saying New York Slice, yeah. uh, the camels and through the desert, the, uh, I don't know, chiclets or whatever they call them in, in Citadels. Well, a, a, like number of people, a number of people Azul. mentioned Sintra. Yeah. <laughs> you know, same, same glass of Sintra, they look like halls already. So. They look like halls. The original is all look like Jolly Ranchers. Yeah. Yeah, so Roger is noting that uh, yeah, not good for scripting. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, Tabletopia is not good for scripting. Yeah, the eggs and wingspan. A the number eggs and of people were deciding. Totally do this. this. This could be a whole episode. Yeah, Th yeah. that maybe that'll be our our April Fool's episode for next year. I'll there we go. Market. Edible edible games. Oh, edible games. Chocolate <laughs> Catan chocolate edition. There we go. That's the one you can actually. Eat. It's the only wow. edible board game that I know of. We played wow. it. All right, moving on. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we take a look back and what games played. I can't talk. I don't and even now, know what happened there. The Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take this look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. It's going to be a short one tonight. This was a slow week gaming-wise. Uh, 
we, we went to bed early and just chilled and Netflix more often than we probably should have. Um, Friday night, though, Deanna and I did sit down and play some Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. I realized that we missed this in our last weekly. We should probably be tossing in a little short summary because I mean, we knew there are a lot of Gloomhaven fans out there. So we do live stream these games on Friday nights, not necessarily every Friday, but we try uh, starting at 9 p.m. We did um started at nine on friday and left which scenario to play up to our viewers and it was a choice between the defiled sewers and the beguiling sewers and i'm sorry to say deanna was disappointed the fans went with the defiled ones and i do have to take some maybe more than a little of some of the blame (laughs) for that one as we were rather light on viewers due to twitch notifications not going out and Deanna lost her wish. Yes, she did. Sean was just hoping for Skaven, I think. <laughs> no, it was it was an interesting game. Uh, they were definitely defiled and nasty and gross. There was some gross things to fight. Um, this was our first escape style scenario, which is cool. Um, we've seen those multiple times in Gloomhaven, and I've got to admit, they are some of the hardest scenarios in Gloomhaven. And while that seemed to carry over to Jaws and the Lion, because this was our tightest game ever. Um, yet again, they threw in a new mechanic, something pretty simple. Uh, they just happened to be a sewer area that flooded and everything would shift one scare at the end of the round. But still, it's something new. It's something interesting they're adding to Gloomhaven. And I dig that, that they're making every scenario unique that way. I like that. Um, it was literally down to a single card draw. And... It was stressful. We managed to win it, but it could have went either way right up until the end. And what was fun about this one is we were overly confident for way too long. We're like, this doesn't seem that bad until a certain thing happened and we pulled a certain switch and it was like, oh, this is never going to happen. And I'm still shocked we won. That that got ugly fast yeah. uh, in a in a big way. Uh, and now I'm noting, uh, you know, Pennywise is saying, you know, I, I, I tend to avoid the streams due to spoilers because I'm soloing. But one thing you can definitely check is because of the branching system in uh, Jaws of the Lion, once you've gone somewhere, you will never be able to go back and play those other scenarios. Mm -hmm. So if you have gone a different direction, then hopping on the stream doesn't spoil anything because you can't actually play those scenarios. Yeah. So in this case, if you have done the beguiling sewers, feel free to watch the defiling sewers. Check out the defiling sewers because you're technically not allowed to play them now. I mean, nothing stopping yeah. you from just going in and doing it for the heck of it, but uh, oh, yeah. you can't actually play it for the game officially. Yeah, there are no rules for casual play in Jaws of the Lion, which I thought was interesting. So another cool thing that happened again is another branching pass. So what was neat about this one is this seems to be a real side quest. So as Sean just said, every time in the past when it branched, you couldn't go back to the other way, which I don't think that's going to stop. But then it came back together. So it was like, you did this or this, but then you're stuck doing that. You do this or this, and then you're stuck doing that. That didn't happen this time. We, as far as I can tell, have two totally open ways to go. And then we finish up our stream, right? We, we finish playing and we go to Gloomhaven and we do our, our town event. So every time you finish a game, you have to do a town event. Well, that led to another side quest. So now we actually have three choices for the first time ever. And what we've done is we made the executive decision between Deanna and I that we are not going to progress the main plot next week. The next time we play, we're doing some side quests. So it's either going to be the side quest because we're wondering what the vermlings in the sewers were doing, or it's going to be the one that an Inox hired us to do in the tavern. So one of those two, we're not going to progress the main plot and we are going to let our live chat decide what way we go all right well now this game next game is going to happen at a special time sometime around 11 a.m on saturday november 7th and it's going to be part of our extra life gaming marathon after that special game though things should be back to the regular time 9 p.m on Mm -hmm. fridays Now, in addition to playing Gloomhaven, we did go over and visit Deanna's mom and sister and played some games there and had some excellent spaghetti and meatballs. Uh, Anyone in Windsor, the meatballs at Detta's are fantastic, but they just doubled the price. So they're still good. We're we're not sure if they're worth it anymore. Um, This is where we got in our plays of Ratuki, some more plays of Ratuki, and we tried Macaron for the first time playing multiple rounds. Macaron was the hit. Like, everyone sitting playing was like, wow, this is, this is neat. Like these mom 
was the first to comment, oh, I like this. Like, this is a, a neat way to do it. I was really pleased by um, how well my oldest daughter took to it. She really enjoyed it. And specifically, we sold some games this last week. She's like, you're not getting rid of that one, are you? So that was another one. Um, one thing to watch, though, is we did play the first full game playing on extreme mode, uh, following one of the bellhops laws there that the first gameplay of any game you are going to play extreme. Uh, we missed that the Royal was a group. We were thinking it was a single suit. So when we were doing our single fav flavor, so when we were bidding, we were bidding on individual flavors, not groups. Well, you still bid on individual flavors, but you add up the, the points for both flavors to determine the Royal. Um, what I will say is that if you ever do get macaron once it's out there, if you want to try an interesting house rule, this worked. Like it worked with a single Roy and it worked well. We had a ton of fun playing that first game and we're already sold on it before realizing we were doing it wrong. So to me, that's like an official variant as far as I'm concerned. Like that was one of those extreme plays that definitely didn't ruin the game. I got to admit though, it is kind of more interesting having two Trump suits in a game because that's not the kind of thing you see in a normal game, but it definitely works both ways. Interesting. All right, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So this Saturday is our extra life event. And I realize most people listening to this, it's already done and over with. So I do want to thank anyone who showed up to the live stream and or donated to the cause. Like usually for X, extra life is huge, like a huge event that spans months with multiple events and RPG events and book exchanges and everything else. Unfortunately, this year, due to the global pandemic, it's just going to be us gaming at home for 24 hours, raising as much as we can. So thank you for supporting that. Now, next week, we are looking at, on Wednesday, we are going to be answering a question about RPGs that use standard playing cards, which I thought was an interesting follow-up to this week's episode, where we talked about traditional card games. So we're going to talk about RPGs that use standard playing cards, not tarot cards, because that could be a whole other topic we found out after I started doing a bit of research on this one. Well, Deanna actually started doing a bit of research on that. Now, to tie that in, we are going to review a couple of RPGs based on card-driven mechanics, sorry, uh, fan ah, a couple of board games, fantasy board games backed by card-driven mechanics. So we are going to be looking at Tyrants of the Underdark, a D&D game, and Pathfinder Adventure card game, the 2019 core set based on Pathfinder, which is also based on D&D. So basically a couple D&D based board games, ways to play through RPG style adventures on the tabletop. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Uh, first off, I want to welcome back Joe Swick to our esteemed list of Patreon patrons. Glad to see things must be getting back on track. And thank you very much, Joe, for showing your support yet again. It was good to see you on Monday at the uh, Sean and Brett show as well. Uh, Evil John, thanks for your patience and understanding as far as getting to the virtual game table. It will happen will happen matt lichenwaller thanks matt roger malosh great question today roger and thanks for dropping by our chat room as well zopi thank you well that was the double bell that means my shift's coming to an end and we must have dropped the portcullis early because ryan didn't make it in Though the doors to the lobby are closed and the portcullis is keeping out our blind meeple, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the Oreo Belltop through our new and improved Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. That's New York, Toronto time. And watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the Pando Suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.